hey, look at you, you survived January, well done for that. So it's time to tune in to Folkways, totally 100% legal radio station, which I've been informed is currently sailing just off the coast of St David's. Apparently this is due to one of their staff members having choir practice in the cathedral. So without further ado, let's try and pick them up. <laughs> A very warm welcome to this month's show. You'll have your usual dates and times, so do feel free to grab a diary to make some scrolls. But as well as this, we're looking at ancient Anglo-Saxon field charms, Imolch and much more. February is named after an ancient Roman festival of purification called Februar. It was performed to avert evil spirits and cleanse the city of Rome, therefore encouraging health and fertility. February was originally the last month of the year when it was added to the Roman calendar, therefore this cleansing aspect can perhaps be seen as dusting away the cobwebs in preparation for the new. In Irish, it's Fiora, and in Welsh, Chwevero which are both direct borrowings from the Latin for broom. In Scots Gaelic, it's in Giaran, which refers to the gelding of cattle that took place in the month. In Manx, it's Toshach Ari, which means the origins of spring. And what about those Anglo-Saxons? Well, they knew this month as Sol Manath, Manath meaning, of course, month. Do you remember in January's almanac, we had Wolf Manath, wolf month. So we've gone from wolves in January to what? Well, the name was recorded by our good old friend the Anglo-Saxon scholar Bede in his treatise The Reckoning of Time, in which he says that Solmanath can be said to be the month of cakes which were offered to the gods. It has been discovered that Sol is equivalent to hearth cake in several old English texts. We note, of course, that the offering of goods to the gods is a staple of Indo-European traditions and something that would have been regularly performed at different times of the year. At this time, thinking of the cycles of nature, there may have been an emphasis on waking the fields, where, with the arrival of snowdrops on our verges, we begin seeing the nascent stirrings of spring. This offering of bread that's meant to have happened this month makes me think of the acrebot, Old English for field remedy. This was an Anglo-Saxon metrical charm intended to help fields that weren't doing so well. One version asks us to bake a loaf the size of a hand's palm, knead it with milk and holy water, and lay it in a field. Another version says that dirt from the ground was brought home, mixed with yeast, honey, oil and milk, before being blessed. There's a Christianised version of the Acrebot recorded in the 11th century, where we've got to quickly run to mass with our dirt. However, within this is clearly the core of a far older charm, which, if it's not the direct giving of doughy treats to the gods that Bede records, It appears to live within the same family of traditions. So fret not, it is not a requirement to pop into church with coat pockets stuffed full of dirt or sprinkle the crumbs of your Greg sausage roll over a passing field. But this month, why not muse on the concept of the Acrebot and what value there might be in giving attention and appreciation to the soil that gives us life? that we may not even consider much at all in the modern world. I've included some links in the show notes if you'd like to know more about this fascinating Anglo-Saxon charm. This concept is a perfect lead into Imoch, which is celebrated today, February the 1st. This is the first of the four Celtic fire festivals of the year, the others being Beltane, Lunasa and Samhain, which are dotted between the solstices and equinoxes. Its understated appeal is also one of my favourites. There really isn't anything like when you see those very first spring flowers coming through after a hard winter. 
Yes, we appreciate their individual beauty, but this feels like it's about a lot more. A hint at the easing of our burden, both physically and emotionally. Our thoughts naturally turn to better things, of more light, of green verges, and the many plans we will make in the coming months. Unlike the celebrations in the full throes of spring, the first hint of it, sometimes with snow still on the ground, gives its own unique pleasure. Imolch is an important date in the agricultural year, when farmers prepare their fields for the first sowings and fishermen would return to the sea. There's a little debate about the origin of the word Imolch, which appears to come from the Irish meaning in the belly, although many people translate it now as ewe's milk. Either way, it's concerned with the giving forth of life. This is Brigid's celebration, a goddess of pre-Christian Ireland. She appears in Irish mythology as a member of the Tuatha de Danann and a daughter of the Dagda. Today, she is known as Saint Brigid, as was syncretized with a Christian saint of the same name. According to medievalist Pamela Berger, Christian monks took the ancient figure of the mother goddess and grafted her name and functions onto her Christian counterpart. However, the spirit of Bridge certainly lives on, and many of the traditions of Imolch are linked to her magic as goddess of fire, blacksmiths, wells, healing waters, and poetry. She's also perhaps most famously linked to motherhood, fertility, and abundance. Traditionally, offerings such as food or coins were brought to waterways or wells at this time of year. Sites named in Bridget's honour were especially popular. Those seeking her blessings often asked for healing, but might also ask for protection or inspiration. Popular customs included making a Bridget straw doll or a famous Bridget cross, I've got one in front of me to provide some inspiration as I record this, and in it I see reflected back the image of the sun wheel. It's so interesting to trace the root of Bridget's name. Bridget has been anglicised from the old Irish Brige or Breed. Stemming from the proto-Celtic word Briganti, meaning the High One or the Exalted One, the name likely refers to the goddess's connection to sunlight and fire, but may also be related to dawn goddesses across the Indo-European world. In the Christian calendar, Imolch is known as Candlemas, where candles are lit for the Virgin Mary. Snowdrops are also known as Candlemas bells, interestingly, because they're one of the hallmarks, of course, of this time of year. There is way too much to cover right now to do this festival any kind of justice, and I will return to Imolch and Bridget in future standalone episodes. However, I would like to recommend a podcast episode Bridget in Folk Tradition from the Folklore Fragment podcast at University College Dublin, which takes a very deep dive into exploring Bridget's pre-Christian roots, suggesting she was also a goddess known in Britain and stemming way back to be mentioned in Vedic texts, suggesting ancient significance as a proto-Indo-European goddess. I cannot recommend Johnny and Claire's research enough if this topic is of interest to you and you'll find a link to the episode in the show notes. If you feel called to mark Imolch in some way, then visiting a well or perhaps a stream near you would be ideal. Don't rush this, spend some time thinking about what you'd like renewed in your own life to match the renewal of spring. In this way, we can feel the blooming of our own projects and goals to be outwardly represented by the oncoming march of new life, every day further vitality added. Love it or hate it, Valentine's Day is on Monday the 14th of February, the origins of which are somewhat murky. 
The Catholic Church recognises at least three different saints named Valentine or Valentinus, all of whom were martyred. Some believe Valentine's Day is celebrated in the middle of February to commemorate the anniversary of one of the Valentine's deaths. However, others claim the Christian Church may have decided to place St Valentine's Feast Day here in an effort to Christianise the pagan celebration of Lupercalia. Celebrated around February the 15th, this was a fertility festival dedicated to Faunus, the Roman god of agriculture, as well as the Roman founders Romulus and Remus. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of the month ahead. Freezing cold, but with fields, and as mentioned with Valentine's Day, perhaps hearts are stirring. I also have some good news. Throughout February, we are gaining somewhere around one hour and 40 minutes of daylight. So each day you can imagine catching sun rays in a net that you won't have to start giving back until June. If you woke up in Galway this morning, the sun rose at 8.20 and set at 19 minutes past five. In Glasgow, the sun rose 11 minutes past eight and set at 10 to five. In London, sun rose 7.38 and set at 4.49. The new moon is today, it helpfully having aligned with our calendars to give the general feeling, therefore, of a new start to the beginning of the month. If you're in an area of low light pollution, the dark skies of the new moon give a perfect opportunity for stargazing. In the early night, the well-known constellations of Taurus and Orion are bright towards the south. Orion's a constellation that really dominates the evening sky during the first months of the year, and is always the one I try to identify first to orientate myself. To the southeast of Orion, not very far away, is the constellation of Canis Major, the Great Dog. In the jewel box that is the winter sky, it is this canine constellation that can boast the most dazzling star of all. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky, only a few objects in our own solar system manage to outshine it. It's so bright in our sky because it's one of the closest to Earth at 8.6 light years away. Use Orion's belt as a pointer to find Sirius by drawing a line through the three stars and down. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, winter is the best time to observe the Canis Major constellation, one of Orion's two hunting dogs. The dogs follow Orion up from the horizon, heading from southeast to southwest, pursuing him in the sky as if taking chase. You'll occasionally hear of the mythological story that says that the merry band of hunters are pursuing a rabbit. Interestingly, the constellation Lepus the Hare is close to Canis Major and just below the feet of Orion. So we're geared up to watch the hunter and his hounds careering across the skies, but what else can we spy in February? The Pleiades, sometimes called the Seven Sisters, can also be seen near the Orion and Taurus constellations. This is a small cluster of bluish stars, easily visible. You'll see Venus shining brightly in the mornings, rising over two hours before sunrise. If you're an early riser for work, consider giving a nod to Earth's sister as you head out the door. However, Venus will attain its greatest brilliance in the morning sky on February the 13th. Here you'll see her make a conjunction with Mars, so if you look up you should spy the power duo. The moon reaches its peak and becomes full on the 16th of February. Do you know what this full moon is called? It is the snow moon. No surprises there, as this month we can often see some of the coldest weather. The moon on the 16th is likely to shine down on frosted, glittering fields, peppered with the welcome sight of snowdrops. A quick recap there then, the new moon is today, and look out for Venus on the morning of February the 13th, where you may also see her close in the sky with Mars. If 
you're green fingered, you can find hairy bittercress in abundance this month. Hairy and wavy bittercress are infamous weeds. However, they're also great to eat, having a nutty and peppery flavour. We also have the stunning Scarlet Elf Cup, or Moss Rose as it's called colloquially. They are, as their name suggests, a cup-shaped fungus which are bright red internally and grow in damp, deciduous woodland. John Wright, in his stupendous The Forager's Calendar, includes a quote from his village baker Norman, in which, 70 years ago no less, Norman and his friends would collect both it and snowdrops to make a posy for their mothers, the white and red representing, respectively, the purity and passion of Christ. John suggests they be used uncooked, just to add a dash of colour to a salad, or with some early wild garlic pesto. As mentioned last month, we've also got three-cornered leek and winter lava, a winter seaweed growing high up on rocks above the watermark. As always, careful identification is crucial, and you'll find pictures of February's foraging suggestions, as well as detailed show notes and more, in my exclusive Friends of Folkways posts, which you'll find linked below. Talk to you soon. Hi again. In our next instalment of The Magic Apple Tree by Susan Hill, I would like to read the following. If you enjoy this text, you'll find it linked in the show notes for you to grab yourself a copy. Last night was the coldest so far this winter, with a considerable frost. I woke at dawn in a sudden panic that I'd forgotten to lock away the hens and went out into the garden in dressing gown and wellingtons to check. It was a marvellous morning, the branches of the trees, the fences and grass completely white, the sun coming up in a poppy-coloured ball with a curious hoary beard around it, and the air as still as I've ever known it here, as though the very wind itself were frozen silent. The grass crisped softly under my feet. The hens were locked up and bumped down from their roosting perch as soon as they heard me, so I let them out and then went over to the shed to bring in a couple of logs to top up the stove. This afternoon, I spent an hour or so clearing and tidying the general garden rubbish that we left at the wet end of the autumn, and as I went up and down and around, the robin came with me, in that companionable way of its kind, hopping from tree to wall to fence, and back again, and singing his most rich and expansive song because of the winter sunshine. I talk to him, as I often do talk to the birds, but he is the only one who does not make me feel that such conversation is foolish, because he does seem to listen and to respond. He is aware of my friendly presence. I'm reminded of the robin in that best of all children's books, The Secret Garden. Just as I was preparing to go indoors, I heard a tremendous row around the far side of the house, and when I went to investigate found our own robin seeing off another male who had dared to venture onto his territory with a most fierce display, all puffed out chest feathers and high, angry pip, pip, pip. It took only a minute or two for him to make his point successfully, and then he sat halfway up the apple tree, consolidating his triumph. When it has snowed, we see the fox tracks every morning, They run up our garden from the low wall and around the hen run and then away up the stone steps and across the lane into the field opposite. He makes a regular routine check so that if we forget once to shut the door of the hen house, he will pounce. On winter nights, too, we hear the eerie shrieks of the vixen down in the spinny below sheep hill and the barks of the dog foxes fighting over her. They are sounds to chill the blood to make you pull the curtains together more tightly and throw another log on the fire to make it blaze. Yet, of course, the fox would never harm a human, and when seen at close quarters, he's no more alarming than a dog. I'm always taken aback each time by how much smaller and slighter he is in reality than in my mind, where his villainous deeds and fierce sounds and all those stories about him have swollen him into monstrous size. And fox cubs, like all young creatures, are quite enchanting. I shall never trust him nor encourage him to come near, but the countryside would be poorer without him, 
for in the fox we have a villain and a scapegoat, something to remind us of the essential bloodiness of nature. In this quiet countryside, he is the nearest we get to all those ravening wolves and brute bears of the wild and of legend.